Um, the last part of this chapter um, kind of focuses on birth control and STDs. Um, in terms of birth control, um, these are all the things that you know you can do to prevent pregnancy. You can read that list. We're going to go over each of them. I'll show you pictures of them if you haven't, um, if you're not familiar with some of these. And there are two of these that are starred up here. I have abstinence and condoms starred. Why did I star those two things? What? They're the best? Um, no, not really. Um, these are all things that prevent pregnancy that are listed up here, but there's two that are starred. They are the only two that also prevent STDs, right? So these are the only two that will not only prevent pregnancy, but STDs as well. Um, so this is from another textbook, but I like this chart. This shows the effectiveness of um, these different methods. I'm going to come back to this. So I'm going to walk you through these methods, and then I'll come back to this chart. So one of the ones that I have listed is surgical sterilization. So in uh, female, we call this a tubal ligation, and it is where they cut the fallopian tubes, and usually they'll tie the ends of them off, or they'll cauterize the ends, they'll burn the ends. Um, and so really what this is doing, this does not interfere with hormone release. That's coming from the ovaries. You still release eggs. You still release hormones. It's just that the eggs can't make it down into the uterus if you cut the fallopian tubes, and the sperm can't make it up to fertilize the eggs. So this truly does prevent pregnancy. Um, the downside of this is that your body is really, really good at fixing things that get broken. So sometimes, and it is possible, that if they just cut those tubes and burn them, and they don't tie them, um, those ends of those tubes can find each other and grow back together and you are not protected from, preg from pregnancy anymore and you don't know it. Um, so it is possible that it's not always effective. Um, it also can be reversed. I don't like to reverse it, but they can. A vasectomy is kind of the same thing in a man. Uh, this is where they go in and they cut the vas deferens. Uh, they'll cut it, uh, they'll burn it, and they'll tie it. Um, the difference between these two is that a tubal ligation, because the female anatomy is all internal, this requires a hospital stay. So you go to the hospital, this is major surgery, they're gonna cut you open and they're gonna do this. Whereas for the vasectomy, this happens in a doctor's office. So this is, they give you a little local anesthetic in the area. Um, there is a little teeny tiny, little teeny tiny cut that they can kind of seal up with some medical super glue. Um, most men, though, say, I don't want a vasectomy. It's going to ruin my sex drive. It's going to kill my mojo. That's not true. Um, so, you know, remember, all they're doing is they're cutting that tube that lets the sperm come up. Remember that uh, ejaculate contains not only sperm, that's only 1%. All the rest of it is fluid that comes from the accessory glands, which are all going to still release fluid. So you can still have an orgasm, you still ejaculate, there's still stuff that comes out, it's just stuff that doesn't have any sperm in it, and the sperm's only 1%. So it really changes nothing. Um, so doesn't impair sex drive, does not block the flow of any of that fluid that's coming from the accessory glands. Again, both of these can be reserved, reversed, it's just not always successful. So most of the time doctors, you know, they want to make sure that you are done having children before they do something like this. So here's an image. Um, you can see um, for the female, you can see this one has been cut and burned. This one has been cut and tied, a fallopian tube. Um, and then down here, this is showing a vasectomy. And again, this is just where they cut that vas deferens and, and tie it. There's also for most of these that I'm going to walk you through are for women. Um, there's very few birth control measures that men can take. So most of these are for women. Um, this one is a hormone implant. Has anybody tried one of these before? You may not want to share that. <laughs> um, this is a little matchstick. It looks like a little matchstick. It contains hormones. Um, and uh, this will release hormones for up to five years. Most of the time it's three years or so. Um, and all they do is they put a needle that um, is a pretty fat needle. And they'll just slide that right under the skin. 
and it's usually in your upper arm and it'll stay there uh, releasing those hormones you don't have to remember to take a pill you don't have to get shots um, it just kind of stays there some women have tremendous luck with this most of the students that I've had who've used this say that it makes them a little crazy like all those hormones it's too much um, and it's the same with birth control if you've tried that before a lot of times you may have to try different ones before you find one that works for you and your chemistry. Another birth control measure for women is an IUD. Um, an IUD, you can kind of see over here, that down here. Um, so it's this little device that your OBGYN will insert up through the oz of the cervix and into the uterus, and it stays in the uterus. It has these little wires on it that will come out through the oz of the cervix so that when you go to the doctor and they put that speculum in, they'll see those wires coming out and they know the IUD is still in place. Okay. Um, and really what this is doing is it is not preventing the egg from getting fertilized. It, can still, it still gets released. It can still get fertilized. It can still come down into the uterus. But this is making the uterine lining inhospitable to an embryo. So what happens is that embryo cannot implant in the lining because you have this foreign body in there and you end up, that embryo comes out of your body, okay? So you can still, you still fertilize an egg, it's just the embryo can't implant. Now the problems with this are that you can, your uterus, this is a foreign body. Your body, if you've got something in your body that doesn't belong, like a splinter, you ever get a splinter that's tiny, you can't get it out, if you just wait long enough, eventually your body's going to push it out. Um, same thing with this. Your body is going to probably try to expel it. Um, and if that happens, you might not know that it came out, and you might not know that you are no longer protected from pregnancy. It can also, for some women, cause a lot of cramps. It can penetrate through the uterine wall, cause a lot of bleeding. For some women, their periods are worse when they have an IUD. Also, because it's a foreign organism, you can get infections in the uterus because you put something foreign in there, okay? I would say that the birth control pill is probably one of the most common measures of uh, preventing pregnancy. This is a, contains a mixture, most birth control pills are a combination birth control pill. So they have estrogen and progesterone in them. They have both of those hormones. And so let's go back <coughs> to this graph. And let's look at estrogen and progesterone. If you'll notice where estrogen and progesterone levels are high is over here. It's in the second half of your cycle, right? It's after you've already ovulated. So again, what happens after you've ovulated is remember you now have a corpus luteum releasing progesterone, maintaining the lining. And if you're pregnant, progesterone levels stay high. So do estrogen levels. So estrogen is that hormone that causes your breasts to get a little bit bigger. A lot of times it'll cause, um, you ever hear people tell a pregnant lady she's glowing? It's a really, really nice way of telling a hormonal pregnant lady that she's a little oily. It's really. Um, because estrogen makes your skin more oily. And so what happens is when you're pregnant, these two hormone levels are really elevated. So have you ever heard somebody say that when you take the birth control pill, you trick your body into thinking you're pregnant? And so you've ever heard that? That's exactly what's happening. When you take these pills, your hormone levels are now going to be elevated, and they're going to mimic what they would look like in the last half of your cycle. So your body sees these elevated estrogen and progesterone levels and goes, oh, I already ovulated, or oh, I'm pregnant. I don't need to ovulate. And so you don't ovulate. This is how it's suppressing ovulation. Um, it is basically telling your body you've already done it, you don't need to ovulate again. Okay? It's tricking your body into thinking you're in the last half of that menstrual cycle. Um, now, for the birth control pill, um, this only works if you take it at the same time every single day. Um, so you gotta take it at the same time every day so that those hormone levels stay at a high level. If you forget the pill one day, your hormone levels can drop. Your body goes, oh, we're not pregnant. Let's ovulate. And you can ovulate. Doesn't happen all the time, but it is possible. 
It is also possible that if you take things like antibiotics, it prevents those hormone levels from getting elevated, um, and then you will ovulate. So antibiotics can interfere with the birth control pill. So definitely if you are taking the pill and you're on antibiotics, you need a backup plan. Um, and you gotta take it at the same time every day. Um, your doctor, if you are on the birth control pill, because it has estrogen in it. Um, estrogen, there are a lot of female cancers that are estrogen based. So breast cancers, cervical cancers. So a lot of times in order, a doctor will prescribe birth control pills for one year. And in order for them to refill your prescription, you gotta go back and you gotta have a pap smear. They gotta look at that cervix and they'll usually do a breast exam and they make sure that no cancer has appeared during that time. And then they'll re-prescribe that pill for another year. So it's year to year because they wanna make sure that you haven't developed something you shouldn't have. <coughs> now some women are really susceptible to synthetic hormones. Um, it makes them do crazy things. I have heard students say that you know, they don't like taking the birth control pill because it makes them gain weight. You know, you take the pill and five pounds. Easy, you'll gain five pounds. And a lot of times your breasts will get a little bit larger because again, you're tricking your body into thinking you're pregnant. Um, so there is a mini pill. A mini pill just contains progesterone. It is slightly less effective, but uh, there's a lot less side effects. So if you really don't tolerate the combined birth control very well, um, then you may could try this one. Some women, um, after they have had babies, um, if they are breastfeeding, they cannot take the birth control pill, the combined pill. They can't have the estrogen when they're breastfeeding. It'll dry up their milk supply. Um, and so sometimes, you know, if you're still breastfeeding but you're not ready to have another baby yet, uh, you can take the mini pill. Um, it will prevent you from ovulating, but it's not supposed to dry up your milk supply. Uh, I've heard people say that it still does, um, but it's not supposed to. So uh, you probably are familiar with the one in the middle, right? That's a condom. Um, but some students don't know what a diaphragm looks like, which is like this. It's actually very large. Um, and for a diaphragm to work, it, these are all barrier methods, by the way. They prevent the sperm from getting up into the uterus and the fallopian tubes. Obviously, a condom does that by preventing the sperm ever entering the vagina. The diaphragm works. The sperm can get into the vagina, but this, diaphragm, you fold it up and you put it up into your vagina and when you let it go, it kind of pops open like a parachute. It sits right under the, under the cervix. So when the sperm get released, you basically have like a little cap sitting on top of the cervix so the sperm can't get through the cervix. Okay. Um, and this one is um, a vaginal sponge, kind of the same concept. Usually it has spermicides in it. Um, you do the same thing, you kind of squish it and shove it all the way up in there. Um, and it prevents the sperm from getting up into the uterus. Uh, the only one of these that prevents against STDs though is the condom. Um, there are creams and jellies. There are things called spermicidal jellies and creams. All of these are harmless to the woman, so they don't hurt the vagina, but they kill the sperm. Um, so usually what you'll find, like, um, for condoms, a lot of condoms have a spermicide on them. They'll have like a spermicidal jelly on them. Um, same thing with like vaginal sponges. A lot of times it's better to use the barrier methods with a jelly or a cream that will kill off um, those sperm. So it's, they're most effective when we use them with another method. You can use them by themselves, but again, just less effective that way. Um, the least effective methods are the ones I have listed up here. The first one is the withdrawal method. So this is um, essentially before a man ejaculates, he withdraws um, and does not ejaculate into the vagina. This is not very successful for a lot of reasons. One, uh, in the heat of the moment, it might happen a little bit too late. So it still kind of happens in there. Um, the other one is that there is some pre-ejaculatory leakage that comes out that does contain sperm. So even if you withdraw before, um, before all of that semen is released, there are still some sperm that have been able to get up into uh, the vagina. The rhythm method, have you all heard of this one? Yeah? So I'm, I grew up Catholic. This is what Catholics do. Um, and this is why Catholics have like 10 children. 
this one also doesn't work. This is where, uh, like as a woman, I would look at a calendar and I would say, okay, uh, I've started my period, this is day one, and I'm gonna count 14 days, and in 14 days from the day of my period, I'm gonna ovulate. So around that day, so like maybe two days before and two days after, I just won't have sex, right? So that's the rhythm method, I figure out 14 days from when I start my period, around when I would ovulate, I kind of calculate that out, and then I just avoid intercourse during that time. Not super effective because we all don't have a very regular cycle. We're not all 28 days. Some women are like 36 days, 24 days, like all over the place. Um, and so, like, I have a regular 28-day cycle, and I only know this from doing fertility treatments. I don't ovulate on day 14. I ovulate on day 10. So... Let's say that I were doing the rhythm method thinking day 14 is it, so we don't have intercourse between 12 and 16. Well, I ovulated on day 10, and we had a candlelight dinner on day 10, and my husband got bonus points that night, right? So, in which case, you can get pregnant. So this one doesn't work very well. Um, there are not a lot of male contraceptive options, um, which I think men should be disturbed by that. But as a female, I'm also disturbed by that. I think there should be some options for men. Um, so there are some, um, some things that are going through the test market now. Um, things like vas occlusion. Vas occlusion is where they take a silicone plug and they put it into the vas deferens. Um, it is not the same thing as a vasectomy. They don't cut the vas deferens. They put a little plug in there. So it's like a little cork. It just stops it up. So the sperm can't get out. Um, and so this one is easily reversible. They go in and they suck the silicone back out later when you're ready to have kids. So this is a way that for the time being, you can prevent having a baby as a man. Um, this is currently used in some countries like China. In the United States, we're still sort of in that clinical trial phase. Um, our um, FDA and um, the ability to have drugs on the market our red tape around that is much stronger than it is in other countries, so it just takes a little bit longer for things to be introduced to the United States. Um, there is an implant, just like the NOR plant for women that goes in the arm, there is an <coughs> implant that um, can suppress sperm production. Obviously, it would have hormones in it. This one's getting introduced to the European market soon. And then also there is a male birth control pill, uh, similar to the female birth control pill. This one's a little different in that it will suppress sperm production for 24 hours. So it'll kill off the sperm that you've created and they stay gone for 24 hours. So if you think you're gonna get lucky, you would take that pill and kill off those sperm so that there's nothing that comes out. Um, I know that, you know, I think most high school boys would feel like taking it every day. Like maybe today's the day. <laughs> maybe today's the day. <laughs> so uh, it's just something that you would take if you think that uh, you're gonna have intercourse. Um, let's go back because I want to show you this graph now that you know what these are. So this one just talks about the efficacy of each of these that we've talked about. Obviously, the one that is the most effective at preventing pregnancy is abstinence, which is not having sex. Um, <clears throat> surgical procedures like tubal ligation and vasectomy, these are 99.6% effective. And I think most of this has to do with, you know, after a man has a vasectomy, there are still sperm that are in the vas deferens. They may be up higher in the vas deferens. And so I think the normal protocol is that um, it has to be a, either a certain amount of time or a certain number of ejaculations before a man can have unprotected sex. Like make sure we clean out the tube. There's no sperm in there kind of thing. And so if you have a vasectomy and three days later, later you have unprotected sex, it is still possible that your partner could get pregnant. So you just have to either wait a certain amount of time or have so many ejaculations before you have unprotected sex. That hormonal implant for women is about 99% effective. Um, and I think most of that has to do with, you know, it lasts anywhere from three to five years, depending on which one you get. And I think um, on the tail end of that, as the hormone levels in that implant start to drop off, you are less protected. IUD and foam versus just an IUD. Um, so remember, this is that little thing that gets put into the uterus. Um, obviously, if we add foam to it, anything's gonna be a little bit more effective because we're gonna kill off those sperm. Again, the IUD itself is only 95% effective because again, you can expel it, not know it's gone, and still get pregnant. Okay, 
so these are real numbers. These are based off of people using these things. <coughs> Notice the birth control pill, oral contraceptive. Now, if you read a birth control pill pamphlet, it'll tell you it's 99.9% .9 effective at preventing pregnancy, right? In real life, it is only about 94% effective because most women don't take it every day at the exact same time. Um, most women, you know, you take it when you wake up. And you may wake up some days at 6, and you might wake up other days at 10 a.m. Um, and so that's going to make it a little less effective. Okay, so it has to do with use. Um, notice this one, the condom. There's a condom down here, and then there's another condom up at the top. This one is 86% effective. The condom at the top, notice it says cheap brand, 70% effective. Listen, I'm all about a good sale. I love things that aren't clearance. But when you are buying condoms, that is not the time to bargain hunt. Like, you, like the most expensive one you can buy, buy that. Buy the one that's in a gold box. The most expensive one. That's what you want. Um, things like diaphragms, the vaginal sponges. Again, remember, if you just use a spermicide by itself, it's less effective than if you combine it with something else. Um, at the very top, the least effective are things like the rhythm method and the withdrawal method. Um, and then at the very, very top, it, you can't see it, it says no method at all is only 10% effective. So if you're just having sex, there's a great chance that you can get pregnant. Yeah. So what about the people who get shot? Is that the same as the Um, Yeah, like the depo shot. Um, yeah, I think, well, no. I think the depo shot would be pretty similar to the hormonal implant in that you're getting this sort of slow release hormone. Um, and what is, how long is it, three months? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I would think that on the upfront it works really well, but as you get close to needing another shot, it's probably a little less effective. Um, so yeah. How about like you don't have a period when you're pregnant, but you can when you're on the birth control pill, like if you're tricking your body to make you pregnant? Yeah, so, it so you know on your birth control pack how you have Two different colored pills. You'll have like the green active pills that have hormone in it, and then you have that one day of a placebo pill. The placebo pill has no hormone. So when you take that pill, your hormone levels drop off. And if we were to go back to that chart, this one. So you take the pill for three weeks, and your hormone levels are way up here. And then the week that you take those sugar pills, your hormones drop off because there's no hormones in those, and that's going to trigger a period. So there are pills that you can take, I don't know what it's called, season neat, season now, season something, where it's like three months of active pills, and then you take a sugar pill. Well, for those three months, you probably won't have a period. And then when you take the sugar pill, your period usually starts within a few days of starting the placebo pills. So like Is that what you mean? Yeah, so if like you don't ovulate while you're on birth control pills, so what is your like actual period? Like where does that come from? Well, your hormone levels are high. Estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is going to help you beef up the lining. So the lining is nice and thick because you're taking estrogen. And progesterone is maintaining the lining. So when you stop taking those hormones and they drop off, you shed that lining that you just created with all those hormones. Uh, okay. Um, I've had people ask, do you have to have a period when you're on the birth control pill? No. And my mom, you know, she's old school, so um, I remember taking that three-month birth control pill and didn't have a period, and she's like, oh, that can't be good for your body. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, you know, you're already taking the synthetic hormones, so you don't have to have a period um, at all. It doesn't matter. Does that affect you, though, like you try to children later on? Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that, but no, no I mean, you know, I, I have friends who, I was on the pill for 10 years, and here's the thing, is it was not covered by insurance when I was on it, and then when I went off of it, like a month later, insurance started paying it, so I was paying $60 a month for birth control pills, and I couldn't even get pregnant, it was crazy, it was such a waste of money, um, but I have friends who were on the pill for just as long, and they went off the pill and got pregnant like that, so... No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, there's one more on here that I'll mention. Um, I feel like this is what old people do. Douching, have y'all heard of this before? So this is like my grandma used to do this. Um, this is, people don't know what it is. Um, it is, a, it's like a squeeze bottle. Um, and the cap on it looks like a Christmas tree with holes in it. 
It's like a sharp, pointy thing with little holes all over in it. And you stick it up your vagina, and you squeeze the bottle, and water comes out of that little Christmas tree thing, and it's water that smells like flowers, and it's supposed to wash your vagina out. That's what douching is. Um, don't do that. Um, it used to be thought, you know, back, you know, probably 50 years ago, women would have sex, and then immediately after sex, they would douche to try to wash the sperm out, thinking that that's a way to prevent pregnancy. In reality, once a man ejaculates in the vagina, those sperm are out at the fallopian tube within about three minutes. They're already up the cervix and out into the fallopian tube. So you can't get out of bed and get your douche fast enough and <laughs> squeeze it out to get all of that out. So that's not effective. Besides the fact you don't really need to be putting that stuff up in your vagina, it cleans itself out. So don't, it doesn't, it's not supposed to smell like summer breeze. It should just smell like a vagina. <laughs> All right, so uh, the last couple of things I'll mention, um, you know, we're going to talk more about um, growth and development in the next chapter. But since we're talking about pregnancy and preventing pregnancy, I do want to mention this term abortion. Um, abortion is, and, and I think a lot of people don't realize this, it is the intentional which I think is what most people think of abortion. It's the intentional, intentional expulsion of a fetus. But notice in, in the definition, it's the intentional or the natural expulsion of a fetus. So a miscarriage technically is an abortion, right? Your body is naturally getting rid of a fetus that would not have made it full term, okay? Now, if you have an intentional abortion, these can be performed during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. They can get, perf can get performed in a doctor's office. Um, now, um, they tell you this is in a doctor's office. In reality, it's probably not. It's probably going to be an outpatient procedure. Um, they'll probably, this says no anesthesia given. Mm, they'll probably put you to sleep during that, otherwise you're going to hear it. Um, and it is through vacuum aspiration. Have you heard of the DNC before? Dilation and curatage, that's what it stands for. Um, so DNC is what they do, basically. And it is where they dilate the cervix, they make it a little larger, and they go in and they'll kind of vacuum out the contents of the uterus, okay? This is something that, you know, women, like I had a blighted ovum, which means that an egg implant, I had a lot of miscarriages, and it was the egg implanted and then just stopped growing. Never grew, there was never heartbeat, there was nothing there. And my body was like, yay, we're pregnant. And it was just holding on to that little blighted ovum. And it wouldn't let it go. And so my hormone levels were really high. So we waited. I waited as long as I could. And my body just was not removing the contents. And the danger of that becomes, if that stays in there, you, you can develop an infection. And they may have to take your uterus out. Um, and so I had to have a, a DNC, which is very similar to this. They dilate the cervix. They have to vacuum everything out. Um, but during the second trimester, so from weeks 13 to 16, um, they'll usually have to vacuum and then scrape the uterine lining. They have to make sure that they get everything off um, to prevent infection. After week 16, abortions are really risky. They usually won't perform them um, after week 16. Um, there is a, a pill, uh, it's called RU486. This is the same thing as the um, morning after pill. What else do we call this? Yeah, morning after pill or plan B, right? So um, morning after pill, plan B, these have, these have, this has been dubbed uh, incorrectly the abortion pill. Uh, that's not at all what's happening here. Um, if somebody is raped, or if somebody is, you know, has protected sex and the condom breaks, um, or if somebody has unprotected sex and then they realize the next morning shouldn't have done that, uh, they can go to the pharmacy, they can get the morning after pill or plan B, and take that, and all it's doing is it's making the lining of the uterus inhospitable for a fertilized egg to implant. It is no different than if you were to have in an IUD and prevent the, that, that also prevents a fertilized egg from implanting. So it's not an abortion pill. Um, it's not an abortion until it has implanted in the uterine lining. 
Okay. Um, so if it can't implant, if that, that, then it's just you're just not gonna um, become pregnant. Um, infertility. This is pretty common among reproductive age couples. Fifty percent of the time, it's from a woman. Thirty percent of the time, um, it's due to a man. Maybe a low sperm count. And then 20% of the time, it's because of both partners. Maybe the woman doesn't ovulate and the man has a really low sperm count. Usually what they say is after a year of trying, you can consult a fertility specialist. This is from your book. That is not true. Um, I would say that if you are actively trying to have a baby and it doesn't happen in mm, six months, go see a specialist. Do, don't wait. Um, especially for a woman. Because the older you are, the harder it gets and your chances get worse and worse. Okay. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you might not be able to conceive. You know, for a man, a low sperm count can be due to all these things listed up here. You know, if you smoke, you drink alcohol, you wear tidy whities you sit in hot tubs. All of those things can drop your sperm count. Um, so it is possible to bring your sperm count back up. They can give men drugs for that. Um, you lower your stress. You don't drink. You don't smoke. In fact, the fertility... Uh, center that we went to, um, you had to fill out this huge questionnaire, and one of them is, do you smoke, do you drink, all that stuff, um, and if either partner smokes, they will not take you as patients, so they will not treat you until you stop smoking, um, because smoking decreases oxygen supply to not only your reproductive <coughs> organs, but also if you were to get pregnant, to that developing fetus, so they don't want you smoking, so they won't even take you as a patient, and then, I don't, I, I, I don't drink much at all. Um, so it was a big deal for me not to drink. My husband likes beer. Um, he likes like craft beers, the gross ones that are really dark that to me taste like steak. Why would you drink that? I don't know. Um, and so when we were doing all these fertility treatments, I was like, listen, if I have all these shots and I got to go to the doctor like three times a week, you can't drink beer. This is not happening. Um, so he was a sport. He did not have anything um, while, while we were doing all that. But all those things can influence sperm count. Um, if you can't get the sperm count up, then they can use artificial, they can use a sperm from a, a sperm bank, so they can use somebody else's sperm. Um, for women, it's usually lack of ovul ovulation, so you are not ovulating. If you are not ovulating an egg, you can't get pregnant. Um, so there are a lot of fertility drugs. Fertility drugs usually result in what's called super ovulation, where you release lots and lots of eggs. Um, instead of just one a month, you might release three or four or five or twelve or 18. Um, so uh, the superovulation is really what they're looking for when you're doing fertility treatments. And then another reason why women might not get pregnant is their uterine tubes are obstructed. This could be from endometriosis. Um, if you've got endometriosis growing up into the fallopian tubes, that's going to cause a problem. The sperm can't get up and the egg can't get down. Um, also, some women will get scar tissue up in the fallopian tubes. That's possible. Um, and if they're blocked, then you can't get pregnant. Um, and if this is the case, a lot of times you might have to do in vitro fertilization. And this is where um, they harvest your eggs. They actually go in through um, the, ab the abdomen. They'll pull the eggs out. They fertilize them in a, in a petri dish in a lab. Um, and then they'll implant them back into the uterus. The um, problem with this is that it is really expensive. Um, I think average IVF cycles are about, by the time you pay for all the drugs, it's about $20,000, $25,000. Very expensive insurance does not cover that. Um, so another option is adoption, and unfortunately that one is also really expensive. Um, so there is no option that's not expensive. The very end of this chapter, I like to say that this is the part of the chapter where um, this is why you leave the lights on when you have a partner that you're not super familiar with. Um, because some of this stuff is, is gross. You need to see what's happening down there so that um, you don't get any of these. I'm not going to cover all these because we don't have time. So I'm going to let you guys, and I'm sure you, have you all had, I'm sure you've had sex education before, right? No? You all familiar with sexually transmitted diseases? Do we need to talk about sexually transmitted diseases? Um, I'll let you guys flip through some of these. Um, you, you can read them on your own. I'm going to only ask you one question on your test about STDs. Okay, just one. Um, so just make sure so that you can get that question. Just make sure that you read through. Um, and I have lots of very graphic pictures in here. So um, the IT people, they can go back through my search history on my computer. And I'm like, 
they have to think that I have everything under the sun because I've Googled all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but it's anything from gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia, herpes, genital warts. So those are the ones that I put up here. There are other ones, um, but you just want to read through those and look at pictures of those. Um, in terms of preventing STDs, I told you the only two things that will prevent it are don't have sex, and if you do, use a condom, and um, that's the only one that will prevent it. Also, pick your partners really carefully. That helps. I want to mention how, when an egg is fertilized, how the sex of that baby is determined. Um, so, we have two sex chromosomes, an X and a Y. The egg always carries an X chromosome, always. But the sperm can be X or Y. If a Y sperm fertilizes that egg, you will get a baby that's XY. Is that boy or girl? Boy. Boy. That is always going to be male. And if an X sperm fertilizes that egg, you'll get a baby that's XX, and that will be female. Okay? So truly, it is the sperm that's determining the gender of that baby. It's not the egg. The egg is always X. A uh, female will always contribute an X chromosome, because that's all females have, is XX. They can only contribute an X. But if you look at a male, they have X and Y. So that means their sperm are X and Y. So they can, can, they're the ones, the sperm are the ones that are determining the sex of that baby. We've also talked in AP1 and AP2, we've talked a little bit about some genetic disorders, some of which are what are called X-linked disorders. If somebody has an X-linked disorder, a lot of times for a female, it might just be on one of these X chromosomes. In which case, it's usually recessive, and a female is just going to end up being a carrier for it. She's got another X chromosome that's going to be normal, right? But in a male, if they have an X-linked disorder, they only have one X chromosome. So it's going to show. So this is why when we talk about some of these X-linked disorders, a lot of times they're carried by females, but they are almost always expressed in males. So the embryo, usually when that embryo is formed, you can't tell a difference in the sex of that embryo until about seven to eight weeks. Usually the gonads will start to form in the seven, uh, seven eight week mark. Um, about two months before that baby is born, um, if it's a baby boy, they'll start stimulating and releasing some testosterone and it's gonna cause the um, testes to actually descend down into the scrotum. The ovaries will also start to descend, but they stop. They get stopped by that big ligament called the broad ligament. You looked at this in lab. It is this red structure in here. That's the broad ligament. It actually prevents the ovaries from dropping any further. Okay. So I like this picture because it really does show you how very similar the reproductive systems look. So this is a five to six week old embryo. You can't tell if it's a boy or a girl at this point. Right? It looks like the, the, they both look like that. Um, this is a male. This is a female. So let's look at these parts. This is the bladder. Right? Here's the urethra. This is the vas deferens. And here are the testes up here. Okay? So these are all way up in the body. Here's a female. Here's the bladder. This is the uterus. Here's the fallopian tubes. Here's the ovaries. They look really similar. And what's going to happen is later in gestation, the testes in the male, because he's releasing some testosterone, those testes will start to descend, and they'll descend down into that scrotum. Okay? In a female, you can see the ovaries also descend. You can see that they move down, but they get stopped by that broad ligament, so they can't descend any further. Okay? So we talked about... Um, when we talked about like the penis and we talked about the clitoris, I told you that they come from the same embryonic, embryonic tissue. That's this picture. 
So I know you can't see that at the very top, but that's a, the sexually indifferent stage, and they look pretty much identical. And even at this point here, um, you can see that this is the boy and this is the girl, and they look really similar. Um, so this is the penis. You can see it's colored in blue. That's the type of embryonic tissue. But you can see the clitoris, it looks the same. It's the same tissue. But eventually what's going to happen is that gland is going to get larger in the boy. And you can see here the scrotum is forming, whereas the clitoris is a little smaller. And you can see the labia are forming from the same tissue that the scrotum forms from. Okay? So it's very, they're very similar. Um, usually, hormone levels at birth are pretty high in, in a baby. Um, and part of that has to do with maternal hormones that have crossed the placenta and gotten into the baby. I will never forget when my son was born, um, when the doctor pulled him out, not my doctor, but the assisting doctor, uh, was a <coughs> male doctor I've never seen before, and they pulled him out, and he said, well, this boy's nothing but genitals. And I went, what? And my husband went, yes! It's like, no, that's awful. But you'll notice this in newborn babies, a lot of times their genitals are swollen. Um, like the scrotum in a, in a baby boy is usually swollen, it's really red. And even in a baby girl, you'll see the labia are really swollen. That goes away over time, it takes a few weeks. But that swelling is from all the maternal hormones that are circulating in their body. Um, and eventually those maternal hormones work their way out. Um, reproductive organs will grow at puberty when the child starts producing their own sex hormones. Um, they'll get secondary sex characteristics, so like body hair in um, males and females and the axillary regions and the anogenital areas. Um, and again, it's during puberty that reproduction is possible. It's the first time it's possible. Um, we've already talked about menopause. That's just when you stop having a period. Okay. All right, anybody have any questions from Chapter 27?